guys have to be patient on an old coop. Uh, you're doing awesome. It's all right. We got you, and we are just on time. So we're going to be posting this right now to a page that I manage that is also known as TAM Integration. So everybody, we're just about ready to get this going. We're just going to be posting this onto Facebook so that anybody can join and watch because today is free Thursday. Nothing wrong with a free Thursday. And I do not want to try live producer right now. No, thank you. Not now. All right. And so we'd have the title. We're going to put in our title, the sacred mushroom ceremony of the deified heart. And, and go away and say something about this video live with Tom Lane at the Psilocybin Summit. Okay, and now what button do I push to actually, oh, there it is, go live. Go live. Okay, we are, we are so just about set, people. I will That's make awesome. my official introduction in just a moment. Well, what Here. I would suggest before you do that is demote me to an attendee. Power. <laughs> you, don't need power. Me for, you don't need me for this anymore. Uh, how do I do <laughs> that? You um, click the three Wait. buttons in my upper corner. Just kick me right out. Like about right there. Well, just remove or change role to attendee. Yeah. All right. Oh, there he goes. All right. Oh, we got rid of Daniel. Finally, now we can talk <laughs> about him. We can talk trash about Daniel. Okay. Um, I just want to do one more thing here. Make sure that we are going live on Facebook. Yeah, there we are. All right. I'm going to sh share this. So if anybody wants to get on Facebook, this is kind of weird. I'm watching myself and cross multiple levels here. If you want to get on Facebook um, at the TAM integration page on Facebook is a place where we are broadcasting live and um, you can share this to you if you like. And I'm going to go ahead and share it on my podcast page, which is the Entheogenic Evolution. You're welcome to share as well, and we can get some more viewers in here if we like. Okay. And oh, I'm just going to post it one more place, and then then we're 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 really going to get started. Trust me, Dom. All right, one quick one. And I would welcome everybody who is um, attending. If, if you want to put in the chat where you're from and we'll, we'll do some shout outs. And if you want to say hello. Okie dokie, so now I'm just going to get Facebook out of the way. Okay, wow, so what do we got here? We've got Arizona, Canada, Columbia, Washington, DC. Awesome, California, San Francisco, San Francisco. Hey, how's the smoke in San Francisco today, everybody? It's lightening up here in Southern Oregon, which is nice. Northern California, USA, Portland, Oregon. How's the smoke in Portland? Hope it's getting better. I know it's been bad up there as well. Upstate New York, Patagonia, Chile, nice. North Carolina, Lake of the Woods, Ontario, Canada. All right, all the way up there in Canada. Orange County, California, Berkeley, California. From Northern Ireland, oh, fantastic. Uh, NV, is that Nevada, Brian? Tucson, Brazil, Los Angeles. The Twin Cities, Oakland, Utah, El Paso, Toronto, Germany. Much better, that's not a place. Colorful Colorado Mountains. All right, all clear, good, Just talking about smoke, smoke. Yeah, for those of you who don't know, I'm sure most of you know, um, we've had tremendous wildfires here on the west coast of the United States. We've been blanketed in smoke for the past couple of weeks. 
Uh, I am right now in Ashland in Southern Oregon. One of the wildfire, wildfires started burning just about three miles from my house. Winds were blowing 40 miles an hour. They went the other way. So my house is here, um, but many of my local friends and community members lost their homes in the past week. So it's, it's been pretty bad on uh, the West Coast of the United States right now. All right, still smoky here in Los Angeles. Well, thank you very much for sharing where you guys are. Um, I'm Martin, I'm your moderator for Tom's talk today. And um, I know Tom has got a lot of information that he wants to share with you today. As I was um, mentioning earlier, for those of you who are here a little bit early, this is Tom's book, Sacred Mushroom Rituals. And this really is a very unique approach to psilocybin mushrooms, really coming from a very strong background in Mesoamerican traditions. And today Tom is gonna to be telling us all about this very interesting codex, um, which uh, uses pictograms or pictographic language to demonstrate the process of self-sacrifice of your individual egoic self and transformation that occurs through the consumption of the sacred mushrooms, which then transforms you into the deified heart of Quetzalcoatl. And this is really the foundation of many Mesoamerican spiritual traditions that is not about capturing people and ripping their hearts out and offering it to Quetzalcoatl. It's about the sacrifice that you make for yourself. Tom was a guest on my podcast a couple of weeks ago, The Entheogenic Evolution. So if you want to hear more from Tom, I invite you to check out the podcast there. If you have questions as we go along, please go ahead and type them into the side a chat over here. And I will be bringing those questions to Tom probably a little bit later in the talk. And I know everyone loves to share their most amazing um, psilocybin experiences at events like this. Uh, but please uh, keep that for somewhere, sometime else, and let's try and focus on um, just the, the more specific question you have, uh, the better it will be, and um, the easier it will be for me to pass that off to Tom. And I'm also going to be sharing a number of images with you um, throughout Tom's presentation. So we'll kind of be toggling in and out of actually seeing Tom and then um, sharing the screen here from my computer with the images. And so Tom, you just let me know when you want me to share. I have the full image to start and then we have all the individual ones as you need them. Yeah, I'll uh, bring one up like this when it's time to start the first one. Okay. Okay, well, what I want to start off first is the uh, Quetzalcoatl was a Toltec and the Toltec ex civilization existed in the Central Valley of Mexico long, long before the Aztecs. And uh, what I'm going to show you is actually a Mixtec, Utatona Codex. It is the codex of the uh, sacred mushroom rituals of the sacred heart, of the deified heart, and also the cells of Sochimilico. And uh, you've got to realize Quetzalcoatl was a man king, and then he became and founded these sacred mushroom rituals. It, he became enlightened, I think, by the sacred mushrooms. And they developed the whole philosophy because the teot, and it was based on these tamalin, which were ancient sages. They were called the men and women who know. And both men and women were these ancient sages, just like Quetzalcoatl in his temple, usually a avatar, which they didn't have gods like the Greeks and Romans, they had energy emanations. But these avatars usually had only a male or a female uh, cotillery of people who served the temple. But Quetzalcoatl was both male and female in the temple of Tylock, where they kept this ancient knowledge. And he taught this knowledge to the totals. Totally, he stopped human sacrifice, sacrifice at any time. He, he said the only thing you should ever sacrifice is your own but, blood or a butterfly or flower. And he also stopped the war between all the tribes. And uh, the Toltecs got mad at him when he started teaching all the other tribes these rich. Answer for all people. Then he left the Toltecs 
and went to the Mayan area and became uh, like Culiacan. And the thing I want to emphasize, the Toltecs were from about 300 AD to about 1100 AD. And in that time, the Mixtecs, the Zapotecs, and also the uh, Mazatecs were a part of these sacred Russian cultures in the Central Valley. Now, when the Mexicana in Mexico came out of the harsh desert, they didn't even have a god. Uh, Quetzalcoatl had taught people like this connection between the earth, the cosmos, and their heart. They'd only had witches in the desert, and not witches like we think of today, but uh, a witches that could go into a trance and find out the animals to hunt. When they came out of the Central Valley, it would be like going into, say, Rome or Washington, D.C., and all of a sudden claiming you found this great civilization in, in your parents or grand, great grandparents, your ancestors did it. They claimed it for themselves and they took over to Atiwakan. Well, this uh, codex I'm going to show you is not only pre Columbian, but it's sort of pre Aztec. It was found in Montezuma's palace. They had taken it from the uh, mixed text and they had also taken another book was the sacred book of sanctifying the land and these two books Cortez took but they were actually mixed tech were called people the rain or people the cloud and uh, if we put this first one up here go ahead okay let's do a screen share who can see or just me Okay. Oh, yeah. Hold on. Hold on. It's giving me advanced sharing. Okay. Does everybody see that? Okay, great. Now, what's important to realize here that these colors were all meant to be seen in this thing in the mushroom time or the mushroom where these images would come apart and start to become alive. This is a pictograph, and even the colors mean something. Every color means something. And the first thing to realize is you have to see the red vertical line, this red vertical line, because uh, these motifs were red from the bottom right up to the top, where you see the woven mat, then over, and then straight down on the left to the bottom. So if we're going to read this, we're going to start first with a picture of an avatar of Quetzalcoatl, the wind avatar, V, and he's talking to an ancient Tamiline sage. And he's talking to this sage about this sacred mushroom ritual, the sacred mushroom ceremony, the deified heart. And behind this sage is four lizards. You see this lizard with four little balls. Well, that uh, four lizard is uh, a representative of mushrooms like in the wild is living and is having their own standpoint. Now you also see down below an AO symbol, a symbol that looks like an A with a circle through it and two, it looks like they're actually deities. They're deities of the river. They were called Nuhus. And when you look over at the river, it actually looks like a trough with like waves in it. What this means is your life is unorganized. They didn't believe in like, they they believed in sin, but in this I think we're having a transmission issue. Everybody just hold on. This avatar of Quetzalcoatl is V, which is known as the wind okay. avatar. Okay, Tom? Tom, we lost you. We lost you for uh, just a, a minute there. So if we go up. Maybe we could back up a second. And I'm going to pull up um, this one. So this is what we're talking about now. This bottom section. We've lost Tom. Have we lost everyone or am I here by myself? 
Let me know. No, okay. All right. All right. You guys are here. Where's Tom? I'm not quite sure what's happened to Tom. We've lost him. Okay, good, good. We're all still here. Um, so I'm just going to fill in while hopefully Tom is able to log back in. Um, I'm going to send him a quick message on Facebook, uh, letting him know that we just lost him. And this is just bizarre because now I'm seeing myself talking to you guys on Facebook. It's all a little too weird. Okay, but um, let me bring this image back up. Please don't ask me that every time, just give me the option. All right, so what Tom was talking about, um, this is the bottom right-hand corner of that main image that we were all just looking at. And so, here we have the, this red figure kind of in the center, and that is the sage. And then here, these, this is the priest, right? And he was talking about this symbol. Um, oh, here we go. We got Tom back. Are you there? Uh, but you are muted. So we're going to need to unmute you again, Tom. How about now? Oh, uh, there we go. Yeah. No, very so good. would you like me to bring up the um, bottom? Right hand corner image. Yeah, we'll break out the bottom right hand corner again. Okay, here we go. Glad to have you back. Thank you. Now, the uh, the Wa believed in things like a metronome. There was there was no duality in life. Everything was one. This was similar to the Tao Te Ching of the Chinese, the Qi energy in the Polynesian manna. Now, when you see this picture of the water at the bottom. I'm not going to go through every symbol, but the waves mean they considered your life either ordered or disordered. And in this case, your life is disordered because they considered you were a vagrant on earth, that you, there was two sacred times when you were born and willed into existence out of the uterus of your mother, and then you were just a vagrant person lost on the earth till you were reborn again on the earth and to figure it out why you were here. What was the reason for you being here? Now, these, this, this golden and red Nuhu by the river are sort of river spirits and they're talking to each other. And then you see this symbol, which is like for eternal time, which is like an A with the uh, O through it and the way the balls were determine what this symbol meant because they had symbols for different types of time. And then you see the ancient sage, a Tamilan sage, they were typically either men or women. They were called people who know, know. like Mar Maria Sabina was called among the Aztecs, a person who knows. She was more than just a curandero. She was a, a curandero. She was a sabio. And behind uh, this ancient sage, you see four lizard, which represents the four mushrooms and each uh, sacred mushrooms and each color represents something. Green is the most important because it represents life. Uh, red is usually self-sacrifice and black is the other end. And that's when you see all these symbolic Im images, they're different colors, but they were meant in mushroom time, if you were initiate for these to become alive and direct you into this sacred ceremony, and like here we're seeing the wind avatar of Quetzalcoatl, which is called Coup de Bee. And we can, and we'll go ahead and move up now, I guess a little higher to the next one. Okay, so we'll get in. I believe this should be the correct one. Let me know if that's what you're looking for. Right. Uh, now we see in eternal time, and you see four lizard over there, and four lizard is alive, living, and the sacred mushrooms are there, and you see the four mushrooms on his head, but you also see four lizard, and there's four little balls hanging down. So we're now taking the holy flowers of the blood that have been swallowed by Quetzalcoatl, and these are the holy flowers of the blood. Now you, you see on top of Quetzalcoatl above him, 11 lizard, and you see 11 little balls. What this means is now they've taken the sacred mushrooms, and I'll describe how they've eaten them later because this is very, very important. 
But over to the extreme left of this picture, you see Oh, looks like Tom is frozen again. There are typically a lot of jade uh, colors and Quetzal cats, feathers and that sort of thing. Over on the extreme, like the statue you see is Talak, and Quetzalcoatl is advancing toward the Valley of the Ancient Dead. And down below, Quetzalcoatl is a symbol, I mean, Talak is a symbol of corn. And uh, one important thing, one of my curanderos told me in uh, Mexico in a ceremony one time, before the sacred mushroom is anything else, it's food. And we should treat it like food, like corn and pray over it, that it's for our body also, not just for the, the sacred world. Now, I'm gonna go up to the top and here again, you see coup de vie. And Kudavi has severed the head of death. The head of death is cut off, and we're going to somewhere where we're actually going to conquer death and any fear of death, and he's resonating with the earth. You can see the there's an ancient symbol, Quetzalcoatl, made out of wood. It's a Mexican instrument, and he's resonating on the head. And you need to be barefooted or like and something uh, with your feet to the ground because you're going to start feeling the resonation coming out of the earth and you're going to start feeling the emanations going between you and the sacred earth. Now if you look on the facing Quetzalcoatl, it's Xochipilli. Xochipilli, um, anybody that studied any of the Watson books or any of the books knows this was the sacred, uh, well this was the, the avatar of ethogens. In the museum in Mexico City, there's ethogens all over his body. But he holds holding two mushrooms in his hand in this ceremony, which represents the male and female principle. And he has a tear in his eye, a tear of joy, because he's joyously starting the ceremony. Now, Quetzalcoatl uh, taught when you started this sacred ceremony, the fast the day before and about the next day, the fast, but about four hours before, to drink raw cacao, to, to take the actual beans and crush them up and put them in a drink. And this was to get you ready and prepared for the ceremony so you would be joyous. Because the point of this is you're going for rebirth, but you should be joyous. Now, cacao is called by the English cocoa, and that's what chocolate's made from. But when they make chocolate like they do today, they destroy the neural bliss transmitters, the two neural transmitters that are in there, and a lot of the other ingredients. So that's why you have to take uh, the raw beans, which are easy to get on the internet. And Quetzalcoatl, the legend was, gave them to his people for two things. One was for uh, an aphrodisiac, for people in love. Supposedly one of the chemicals in there, PEA is the type of chemical when you first meet your lover, like a man meeting his wife and they both think they're angels and they're head over heels and after a while they come back to earth and realize they're just human. But anyway, uh, Sochapilli was, was also the god of young lovers and of flowers and his sister was too and she was very much in, involved in young lovers and flowers and all the sacred traditions. And like you see, he has tears of gratitude. Now one very, very important part behind uh, Sochapilli is you see the little black insect. Make sure you see that little black insect. Uh, the black insect was a stingless black wasp that made the honey that was sacred to the Mayans and to the Aztecs. They didn't have honeybees like we did. They didn't have the type of honeybee that is now in America and Mexico. Uh, the black stingless wasp is still uh, in uh, Mexico and in Cuba, but you see it has two, it looks like two little antennas sticking out of its head. And for a lot of 
how a lot of a lot of anthropologists thought, oh, this maybe is the sounds of night or something. No, it's the importance of this stingless wasp, but it was put on the honey. And you see the river spirit there. Now, the way these sacred mushrooms were taught by Kesequal to be used was you would bring sacred mushrooms living from the woods, or like today you could bring them if you were growing live, and you bring them from uh, or out of cow patties. And then you would take four candles, like beeswax type of candles. These black wasps also made a type of wax. And you put them in the four directions around these uh, sacred mushrooms. And this is about an hour or two. I'm sorry, this is after you've eaten the coca, drunk the coca cow about three or four hours later. And you have these and usually there's an announcement that the sacred ceremony is going to start because Quetzalcoatl will roar a slice of a conch shell around his neck. So this will be blown to the east to signify the ceremony is going to begin. And right after that, what you do is you haven't taken the mushrooms yet, you start singing to them. You start doing poems. It could even be silent or anybody there, but it's something of gratitude. You're going to thank them for coming flowers of the blood. You're going to thank them for coming a part of your body. And then in these ceremonies that I've been in, the mushrooms actually start moving. Now, I don't mean like this back and forth, like they're walking in the dirt, but they'll start going up and down like this and actually moving like this because they're respiring. They're more like animals and plants and they breathe in oxygen. And in some situations I've been in this, uh, like I said, people seeing this, I remember one American woman passing out. She's sitting on a rug uh, and she couldn't believe that these mushrooms were moving and everything. It was just way too much for her. But then when you take the sacred mushrooms, you take them two at a time representing the male and female principles. And you actually cover them in honey 100%. You dip them in the honey. And then you take the flowers of the blood into your body. And when you take these flowers of the uh, blood into your body, you chew and you chew and you chew and you chew and you never swallow. You're taking them subliminally. Because when you swallow, whatever you do, whether you've drunk something or swallowed the mushrooms, it goes to the small intestines before it gets past to the small, large intestines and out. These are the, and what happens is when it goes to that small intestine, it has to be filtered there. And then it's filtered by the liver before it goes into the blood. Now, what this is, uh, somebody asked what was on top of the B, that's, a, that's one of the river Nuhus. That's a spirit of the river Nuhu up there. So it's dipped in honey and chewed and chewed and chewed and subliminally, it's going to go as a blood transfusion in your mouth directly to your brain, your spine, and the ventral aorta of a house. Your gums, your tongue, and the roof of your mouth if you put an aspirin on it or if you chew, chew, chew your food tonight with honey and your saliva, honey doesn't even have to be digested. It's the purest food in the world. This is subliminal, subliminal. And it's going to go directly around your gums and directly around your, from your tongue straight to the, uh, bloodstream straight to the spine, to the brain, absolutely no filtering. The saliva and uh, uh, honey have changed it from a carbohydrate to alkaloids and a pure glucose. Now the inside of your cheeks, the insides right here, they go to the ventral aorta of the heart, directly to the ventral aorta of the heart. You're bypassing any filtering. And in this sacred ceremony, there's no limit. You sit there and you slowly keep chewing and chewing and chewing. Now your intent in this ceremony, there's many other ceremonies I'll talk about on Monday, but in this ceremony, this is a ceremony to actually meet and bring Quetzalcoatl. Now a lot of people think that this was a Naga, like the Nagas that taught Buddha, and or like 
whatever this female male diamond faceted serpent you're asking him to come in your life and this is a life of self-sacrifice you want to enjoy him now what happens here is you keep eating and eating and eating and then all of a sudden you feel the onset and what happens is your body starts disappearing you can actually feel your flesh start di disappearing you don't have flesh anymore and these are absolutely fresh mushrooms that have just been picked they were living these aren't much a lot of ceremonies you bring in live mushrooms i've never in mexico eaten a dried mushroom but these are ones that were actually in the dirt or i guess you could bring in a cow patty or you could be growing them and what happens is after your body starts disappearing it, you feel like your skeleton's disappearing and then your skull is disappearing and that, that's when you sort of feel like you're wide-eyed. And then right after that, your teeth are like disappearing. And then immediately you come back and you can feel your spine in your back and your spine in your back is like moving in an S-shaped serpentine pattern. And you can do this at home. There's nowhere necessary you have to go. You just have to sanctify the area you're living in and have a dedication to meeting Quetzalcoatl now what happens when this happens is uh, you're actually, uh, people tell me it's a Kundalini, but to me, I just describe what happens. I don't use names, but it's like the most powerful feeling like of, of coming alive and uh, coming out of the ground. So I, I'm not saying it's not the Kundalini. I'm just saying a, a lot of people tell me that, okay? And uh, I could feel this serpentine spine moving all around. And at that time, you feel all this energy coming. And then Quetzalcoatl comes, which is about human size. And when he comes in, he's about human size. He's the male, female dragon that's a Quetzal bird. And he's hundreds of hundreds of diamonds. And they're all flashing the colors of the rainbow. Now, in a healing ceremony two years ago in Nevada, I mean, I'm sorry, in Utah, in Goblin Valley, I was in a place where a guy had been through a motorcycle accident. And the Quetzalcoatl literally came and swallowed him. He was like a rabbit going through him. And he came out incredibly physically healed. And uh, a lot of people stand up and they walk forward into Quetzalcoatl, and that's when you turn into like pure white light. And I've been, I've done this in villages in Mexico in the remote mountains at night, and uh, people would say they saw something lighting up on the mountain. But there's such a thing as bio photons in your eyes, in your brain, like when you snap a camera at night, you see that red, that's, that's because there's light coming out of your eyes. And, uh, I, I, I photograph alligators in the swamp at night. You can see all their eyes, I mean, on a dark moon night. But anyway, these bio photons are coming out like they're shining and your whole face is glowing. Now, the this sacred ceremony was, was saying that uh, your heart life is put in your face, that your, your actual soul from your heart is put in your face. Because in this ceremony, it's, it's really your heart that's directing this. And then the whole body turns into white light and people join in healing. But some parts of this ceremony are like when you're going into the underworld uh, and coming out. Now, some people have had this ceremony before. And Quetzalcoatl is like pure love and pure empathy. And he, he taught there were two things in life, only pain and love. And we have to be, learn to be joyous no matter what happens, because as long as you're born, when you're willed into existence, you're going to suffer pain and you're going to suffer love until your life is over. And the, and the key was to be joyous no matter what happened. And uh, like I said, you can see people when these bio photons are come out in this ceremony, they look like their headlights behind their eyes. And these are really, really powerful that are coming out and all these emanations are coming from the body. You see, these ancient Tamilin men and women, 
they, what they did in life was they took mushrooms and sacred ceremonies and they discovered that there were three types of energy emanations coming, Olin, Nepali, and Maleni. And I'll maybe try to talk about this later, but if you, I always tell people, do not take sacred mushrooms their first time in the dark. Go out in the wilderness. Go out somewhere in a park. Go out somewhere on a farm where you don't see any four corners. And if you take the sacred mushrooms during the day, especially during a light rainy day, uh, you will have this type of animism and communication with plants. That's why we wouldn't be destroying this planet if we could do this. Man sees himself sort of in the center of a uh, clock and all the animals and everything rotating around it like stock. But if you are a dwelling person instead of a technological human, you see yourself on the outer rim with everything else in the connection. Now, when people talk about animism and talking to plants, it's not like blah, 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 we're blabbing. This is emanations coming from the body. These are emanations running through the earth, running through them from you back and forth. And these three types of energies which the ancient women and male sages discovered uh, was like what the Chinese call the qi as a single energy, but what they saw on a mushroom time was a bouncing type of energy, like a bouncing ball, and also a spiraling type of energy, an oscillating spiraling type energy, and especially between humans that were interconnected with each other and a lot of plants and stuff, they saw a weaving energy where it'd be weaving together. And they understood this because they're, they considered everything coming from one source, the teot, and the whole job of the ancient sage or these uh, sacred mushroom guides was to unmask the disguises. They considered all reality was just a disguise and you had to unmask it. Okay, let's go to the top picture if we can or go higher up. Okay, but for one second, we have a, just a couple quick questions that I think would be great to just quickly address. You already mentioned it, but could you tell us again, what is the name of this codex that we're looking at? Well, if you want to read a great anthropologist thing and write this down, it's a Yuta, Y-U-T-A, T-H-O-N-A, Mixtech, M-I-X-T-E-C, Mushroom, Codex of the First Dawn. Now, if you go online, you'll see this. Uh, the Utatona, yeah, that's first down. There's actually anthropology reports on this. It used to be called for a long time the Vienna Codex. It was after Cortez got a hold of it, he took it to, I went to a lot of places, but it ended up in, it's now in the museum in Austria. And it's very faded. I think we maybe have one picture at the last, but the British Museum made this picture what it would actually look like. It was made on deer skin with these sacred col colors. And then it was stuccoed over. And this was meant to be a pictograph guide that would come alive when you're taking the sacred mushrooms. And these different avatars would come over there and start to move. It was not just to be seen in normal time, but in the mushroom time. Is there another question? Yeah, um, there's just been a question is, were you talking about a specific variety of psilocybin mushrooms? And of course in Mexico, there's what, like 50 or so different varieties of psilocybin mushrooms. So is, is there a particular mushroom that's involved in this ceremony or um, a group or we just have well, a question any of the about. ones it could be eaten. Uh, it's more that you treat them with reverence and you treat them with uh, as a sanctification and how you're doing them and how you're eating them. Now, they the most powerful ones in Mexico were the Durumbis and the and the uh, Mexicana, and the most powerful of all. Nothing compares to the Zapotecas. In fact, a lot of the curanderos or people would say 
This holds the power of God. This is divination. This is uh, for uh, physically, it, it generates an unbelievable amount of energy. And it also shows you how your thoughts and what you're doing is going to affect and how it's going to affect you in life. And uh, there's a question somebody asked, and I just had the answer. I'm sorry, I didn't remember it, but. So anyway. we, do have one, we do have one more quick question here. It just, just says, can you explain the mushroomed time? And this is actually related to some of the symbols that are involved. Yeah, I'll actually show you, we'll show you later the mixed tech symbol of uh, the mushroom time. It means you're actually on the mushroom, you've taken it and you're past the onset. Because the sacred mushroom, they consider puts you in a different time space, almost like the time space of a little child that doesn't have any future, doesn't have any past. If you look at the metronome, what messes people up in life, they're always trying to balance their past with their future and they can't stay in the moment. And so, because they can't stay in the moment, they got all these anxieties and worries. And like people said, worries are interest paid on trouble before it happens. But when you're in the present, in that present moment, then it opens you up to your body. And I'll talk about this later, actually directing your subconscious and conscious. And what we're doing in the sacred ceremony is we're going deep into the unconscious and coming out of it to be reborn into your ancient DNA and from when you were uh, born. And this is called the sacred ceremony of the deified heart, the deified heart, because of how they felt that your soul life would be expressed in your face. Okay. Okay, should I share the next image? Yeah. And you guys out there, tell me, can you see my cursor? We'll put it over on the, uh, the initiate holding two mushrooms. Yeah. Okay, now I mean, this is the initiate holding two mushrooms, and that represents you. And the mat up above, it was important to be barefooted, or what they called on a woven mat, like a woven grass mat. They were called serpent mats for... Uh, diving into this underworld and, and before it, you see the sacred vessel to hold the honey to put the mushrooms in and you see the crown of creation and the wall of creation and Maria Sabina supposedly had seen and gone through the wall of creation. I've seen it before in a sacred mushroom ceremony but I was never able to get through it. I was just totally in, immersed and amazed by it and uh but the wall of creation on the other side is all this the knowledge of the universe and understanding of everything and why it happens but this uh is an issue there represents you okay let's go to the other side now the left side okay unless there's a question i can still answer it yeah, go ahead. So now this is the whole left side of the image. So we're reading from, from top to bottom. Right. And I don't have time. It would take an hour and a half uh, uh, to talk about what all these colors and everything meant. But this is on the other side of the initiate, and these represent four, I'm sorry, six sacred portals, men and women of the sacred mushroom and the knowledge that you'll meet when you go into the underworld, and you're going into the underworld with a dragon. In my experience, when I did a sacred ceremony and then went in the underworld, it was like I met all these trees where the leaves turned into rattlesnakes trying to bite me and the roots were all rats trying to eat me and all the animals were coming to get me. And then I had an epiphany. That had to be hell. It couldn't be any worse than that. I had to be there. So I formed an image 
of like Quetzalcoatl or Walt, uh, Christ, they said, just love it, love everything. And then it changed. It flipped back entirely. It flipped back entirely. Now, a lot of people never have that experience. Uh, but my cur my, the current Daryl told me, he says, you're too curious. Your personality, you're, 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 you want to go to more to heaven. You, you have the experience more. But the one of the things I learned was when you see a monster, when you see something terrible, you can flip it to the other side so easily by loving it and feeling empathy for it. To give you an example, in one ceremony, I saw this huge black dragon coming to eat me. This dragon was dripping blood from its jaws. It was jet black. It was at night. There were skulls around its waist. It had fangs. They were all dripping blood. It was going to eat me in total annihilation. And I jumped for joy, and I said, oh, fantastic. This is great. Eat me, and I'll turn you into a love for humanity, and I'll flip you over. I'll change you uh, to some a pure, like an angel or something. And it immediately flipped to one of the avatars of Quetzalcoatl. It was just unbelievable with jewels. And a lot of times when people see these things and they're unconscious, I try to tell them, that think of a metronome. You've seen something on the one complete opposite side. You're not balanced in the middle, but if you, you have to feel this. It can't be an intellectual thing. You can know it intellectually, but you have to be overjoyed that you see this dark dragon or this monster or demon, and then it'll flip to the other side. It'll immediately flip to the other side. And like when you're taking these mushrooms, the reason they're called the holy flowers of the blood is because they're consuming you, but you're also consuming them. And the next picture we see down is that initiate that represents you going into the trough, going into the river. And if you notice the four directions and the four footprints, okay, that ball didn't balance. It's just bouncing around. And then you see the reeds in the river in the person's hand, they're untied, the life is not together. Now on the extreme right of that trough is the Mixtec symbol for the mushroom time. That means you're actually on the mushroom. You see that A and you see that circle around it. And then you see one, two, three, four, five little balls going to the left. That means you are in the mushroom time. That is when, if you're outside, you can actually start to see your body moving and uh, glowing and actually uh, becoming alive. Now, there's two things going on here. There's a physical re resurrection. And there's also a spiritual rebirth and a resurrection. And for a lot of people, they nod off or sometimes go to sleep and they go on these visions. And then they, when they wake up or come through, they see their arm or they see their uh, hands, you know, they see this and oh my God, it's moving, it's alive, there's vibrations in it. Now, we have an unconscious, uh, conscious mind and the heart has 40,000 neurons like the brain. And so what's happening is the body's going to direct the heart. The reason people get messed up on drugs or alcohol or spousal abuse or smoking or whatever is because they're always dealing with their conscious mind. But what happens with this is when the unconscious mind comes on and your living body is there and directing things, you're going to cure yourself or you're going to cure things by uh, synchronization with the earth, with your heart pulsating with the flowers of blood in it and breathing. And if you just stop your breath up and down your spine at certain places and breathe deeper. But the most amazing thing is if, let's say you think a nasty thought, a racist thought, a hurtful thought, you remember something ugly about somebody you can see your hand actually turning black, the color is starting to turn black. But when you thought peaceful, loving thoughts, it's turning the color of gray gene, gray gene, gray jade, I'm sorry, gray, jade green, and your, your body is actually teaching you to change the channels. 
I've had a lot of people in ceremonies think, oh, I'm thinking this nasty thought or it's terrible. I must be a terrible person. I tell them, that's just nothing but a radio station. When you were willed into existence and came out of the womb, you came with all this conscious and unconscious, but you've been taught all this stuff since childhood. In the first seven years of a child, it's totally different. All the child wants and knows is how it feels in the moment. That's why it's important to love children and make them feel wanted and make them feel good because that's all it knows. Well, listen, your body is really simple. Your body is like a child. It just wants to feel good. That's all your body wants to do is feel good. And so it's saying to your mind and your unconscious, be reborn, be reborn. And get this out of your mind. Think good thoughts, think positive thoughts, and let's breathe. Let's let go. <sighs> breathe the angels of the air in and get them in your blood. And your body will train your mind and your unconscious to heal yourself. And then that's why they have so many people from depression and stuff and all these things uh, change because they can, they understand how it's happening. You know, if you're in your conscious, unconscious mind, it's just like a little teeny tip of the iceberg. And you've got all this huge unconscious from when the time your ancestors and for you underneath. And it's like garden a city and it you go say oh i'm not going to take heroin or meth or fentanyl or whatever and you're a party and somebody slips you a xanax or you have one drink too many and before you know it you've done this stuff and you're off and going but when you have this epiphany when you're living a live intelligent body trains you and trains your unconscious and unconscious mind you know what it's doing you can still make a choice, but you know what it's doing. Now let's let's go to the picture that we see there at the bottom. We see. Oh, I didn't mean to click off over there's questions. Did, don't we have we we have a close up of this one? Oh, okay. Well, now we're seeing the ancient codex pictured as it exists in Austria, actually in the museum. This is a picture of it in the museum. And the other picture was uh, how the British Museum drew it what it would have looked like when Cortez got a hold of it, when it was colored in and fresh and stuccoed. And what we're seeing here is on the extreme left, Tullock, but Tullock is an avatar of Quetzalcoatl. And he's looking at a, another avatar of Quetzalcoatl called Lord Two-Face. And Lord Two-Face has two faces, one looking into your past, one looking into your future, and uh, holding the sacred mushroom. And this is after you've come back when you've done the ascension to the sun. Now I'd like to go, can we go backwards, Martin? Sure, hold on one second. To the picture. Uh, hold on. This is this is so smart, it knows the ones I've already shown and have booted well, them out okay. of the way. I can I can explain what it what it is in that picture. Uh, what this is is the uh wait hold on i'm sorry i messed things up oh boy okay we're good we're gonna try it again all right we got okay, it back well, let's just leave it there okay but in this you see on the left foot i'm sorry the forward foot toward quetzalcoatl he now has his foot on the ball so he's got his life balanced now he's balanced that's the whole thing among the ancient the law, the, the uh, Mesoamericans was to leave a balanced life. So he has the ball balanced. And if you could see on the other side underneath Quetzalcoatl, you would see the four reeds tied together. And like I say, this is an ancient pictograph that's describing all this. Now let's go through uh, some of the other pictures and I'll try to show them some and or show them. Let's go through the next one. 
Okay, so now we're moving on to the stone tablets? Yeah. Okay. There were three stone stellas found in the sacred mushroom where the ceremonies were done. These three stone stellas were a guide to do the sacred mushroom and they were actually designed to vibrate and to bring you in communion with the sacred mushroom. There were three of them. They're four-sided made of basalt. They're made of basalt. Uh, and I said the ball was balanced, the ball of life. Yeah. And these three stellas, when the Spanish and the friars got a hold of them, they broke them into three pieces and painted them red. I've actually got pictures of when they were discovered. They buried them because anybody, they didn't want to know about this sacred ceremony, so they buried them. And they were found in 1961 in the Temple of Antiquity. And they've been put together now. Now, this one is symbolizing the start of the sacred ceremony. At the very, very top, very, very top, you see the female disembodied eye. The female disembodied eye is going to follow you in this ceremony. And right in the middle, we see you, the initiate. And you're in the mouth of the jaguar who's going to take you into the underground. Now, I've done this ceremony with a Russian midget from Russia and a, a Vietnamese Buddhist priest, and they all saw the same thing. Now, down at the bottom is symbolic of where the ceremony is taking place. And it's a... Uh, the ceremony is actually, you're, you're going to be feeling these resonant and vibrations coming from the stone. And I'm trying to describe this in shorthand rather than giving you all, all the details. But in this Quetzalcoatl, you, you can see above him, it's what's considered his cape. It's his plumed wing cape of taking you into the underground and some of the symbols are of self-sacrifice and where the it's taking place. Let's go to the next one. Okay. Okay. Now, this one and the next one, I, I want to show you this. This is a female disembodied eye that's watching you in this, and it's surrounded by the Quetzal figures. And in one ceremony I was in, this curandero held up a mushroom to me and actually held it up in front of me and asked me, what's your intention? Why are you doing all this? And the mushroom actually became an eyeball. And even the other people could see it there. And he was looking at me with real intent and looking at my life and sort of divining it. And I was trying to figure out why. But this is what this is, the all-seeing female eye. Okay, go ahead next. Okay. Okay, now, this isn't from the Stellas, but this is in one of the temples of Teotihuacan. And you see that up the top, it looks like four eyes. The basalt has been taken out of them. And then below the Chimera, which represents, this is in Quetzalcoatl's sister. And it represents a disembodied eye at this temple now. And then you see the three below symbols. But I'm just letting you know this is all over Mexico. And Wasson in particular has a chapter in his book, The Last One, Persephone's Quest, where he wrote about this. And he has pictures, but they're not in, in color. But th this is just another picture showing you the disembodied eye, which is very common in ceremonies for people traveling, or for divination. Okay, next picture, please. Okay, this is, uh, that's the same picture. Let's go to the next one. Okay. Maybe we went uh, the wrong way or I put it there twice. Oops, that's my fault. Uh, yeah, I think, I think we might have three copies of the same. This might be what you're looking for. Okay. 
The other picture I was looking for is similar to the other picture, but it was actually, I put the wrong one up there. It's Quetzalcoatl coming out and ascending. The uh, first picture was he was descending. The second picture he's ascending in the dragon serpent. Uh, Here, well, th 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 this might be it. No, that's the first picture. That was the one we were on before. So, oh, I'm sorry, my apologies. Then maybe it's this one. No, but that's okay. Uh, it's more like his mouth is closed. It's almost similar to the first picture, but his mouth is closed. Now in this picture here at the top, you're seeing the all seeing female eye and then you're seeing Talak. And if you notice this sacred ceremony that Talak has like Google eyes, his eyes are Googled, real big eyes. And you can see on his tongue, the flowers of the blood coming out of the central part of his mouth of the sacred ceremony of the deified heart. And then in the other two parts of his tongue coming out are two sacred mushrooms, meaning he's eating a male and female at the same time. And at the very bottom, that represents the rivers. It's flowing the, the rivers of light are flowing. And uh, anyway, this, this is symbolizing uh, the mushroom time when he's on the sacred, uh, uh, eating the flowers of the blood. Now these st three Stellas of Xochimilco are in the Museum in Mexico City. And if you go to the city of Xochimilco, they have replicas outside now at their museum. Okay, so Tom, um, unfortunately, I am getting a message that we do need to go ahead and wrap it up. But let's go ahead and let's inform everybody that you do have your Monday five-hour workshop, correct? Correct. And that is starting at, uh, I believe, 12 noon Pacific time. It's going from 12 noon to 5 p.m. Pacific time. Um, I think that you do need to sign up for that. Um, for everybody here, if, if you want, I just want to let you know that on my personal Facebook page, that's Martin W. Ball on Facebook, I have posted the image that we have been talking about today. So you can go to my page and it's just one post down. And so you can take a look at the, the image there. And then also, if you want to hear more, you can go to... Hey, um, that is the link to my podcast. And Tom and I did have an extended conversation just the other week where we're talking about this. And so I really encourage you to actually have the image in front of you and kind of go through all of this again. We know that there's a lot of information. And of course, here's his book again. It's Sacred Mushroom Rituals, The Search for the Blood of Quetzalcoatl. All right. And uh, Tom, do you have an email address that you can share with people really quickly? And then we do need to wrap yeah, it up. Yeah, uh, it's Tom Lane, L-A-N-E, solar, S-O-L-A-R, at gmail.com. I, I worked in solar energy for 40 years. That's why I use Tom Lane, solar, gmail.com. And I'd be happy to send anybody that sends me an email the chapter of my next book, the book that Martin showed you, I wrote for beginning people and beginners and neophytes and using the sacred mushroom. The last 30 pages of this book in my next book, which will be published in 2004, are much, much more in detail to somebody who wants to be a, a guide or a sage or really drill down. And I'll send anybody that sends and requests it a chapter or two of my next book that's finished. And you really need to have these pictures because the chapter two, like Martin was saying, doesn't have these pictures in them. So you need to be able to see them. I also recommend you go to that Utah Tono Mixtec Kodak pictograph of the first dawn and you can download what the archeologists are saying about it. They are pretty much agreeing with me on everything except they haven't done this in the mushroom time and they don't know what that insect is for, for the black honey. Also, we have, I have a Facebook site called 
sacred mushroom rituals and ceremonies and everybody's welcome. It's just very simple, sacred mushroom ceremonies and rituals. And you can learn about these rituals from my book. And the most important thing is your own reverence, your own sanctifying and what you feel. And we describe, I'll describe some of these ceremonies and how they're done, but it's very important even what you talk. That's why I call them sacred mushrooms. I don't use the word magic or psychedelic. You know, these are things that are empowering yourself. And if we're gonna change the world and everything, we have to be able to use these to connect with nature and to heal ourselves with them. And they, they were used for healing and divination. Okay, I think we do need to wrap it up, Tom. Thank you very much and audience. Thank you all for your questions, for your patience with the, any of the technological issues that we have. We encourage you to enjoy the rest of the psilocybin summit. Spread the word to other people. Uh, let them know that this is taking place and that it's free all day today and that there's much more to come over the weekend. And of course, you can catch Tom again on Monday, 12 to 5 p.m. Pacific time. It's a special session that you need to sign up for. So thank you all, everyone. It's been great having you here. Right. And we'll talk a lot about the rituals and the ceremonies in much, much greater depth, like the ceremony of the twine, the ceremony of the disembodied eye, all those sort of things. And we'll go into much, much more on that. Okay. All right. See you all later, everybody. Hasta luego.